Today we're going to talk about springs, uh, continuing with uh, talks about uh, particle systems. Uh, this, the notes on springs are uh, linked off of, or it's a submenu to the week nine notes on WordPress. So I wanted to just uh, talk about a few things here. First of all, uh, we'll jump to Robert Hooke. Uh, uh, discovered the spring law, which is F equals minus KX. So what this means is the force applied by a spring is uh, some constant K called the spring constant uh, multiplied by the stretch, how far the spring is uh, stretched or compressed. Okay, so it's a very simple rule, uh, easy to implement, and uh, let's see. And this results in uh, kind of uh, spring-like uh, behavior. This is a graph of uh, the uh, position of a weight on the end of a spring as a function of time when damping is involved. If, if there's no damping, then the, uh, uh, the oscillation uh, does not decay and it would, it would remain constant. In fact, there are different kinds of spring behavior you can get. If the damping is very high, uh, we call that an overdamped system that just sort of um, uh, slowly moves the displacement to zero. If it's underdamped, then you overshoot the displacement and you vibrate back and forth. And if it's critically damped, then you uh, uh, quickly converge on the displacement. Um, okay, and this allows us to, to make some really interesting behaviors like the one that we see here. So again, um, the this is part of a particle system, so there are multiple particles, well, two particles involved and a spring, and so there's force on both of the particles, and we need objects to keep track of each particle, and so on. And so the code, you know, stretches out to a few, maybe a few pages here to make these particles and connect them with the spring and uh, do all the mouse interaction. And so uh, what we're going to do is, uh, like we did with uh, particles, is we're going to make a single spring system with two particles and keep it as clean and simple as possible to, just to understand the, the physics and the math uh, behind the particle movement. And then hopefully that will make it much easier to understand uh, how to build a particle system where you have many particles perhaps connected by many springs. Alright, so right now we're running this sketch and we've got one particle. This is sort of where we started off on Monday. Since we want uh, a spring connecting things, we're going to make a second particle. So let's just make, uh, we'll call it PX2 and uh, maybe we'll put that at 240 and PY2, which we'll leave that at 200. And we'll go down here and we want to draw two ellipses, you know, one at PXPY and one at PX2PY2. And let's make a line connecting them. So we'll go from PXPY to PX2PY2. There's the line and we'll run that and there we go. We have two particles connected by a line. Let's add some motion. Uh, we are going to um, allow, I'm going to allow the particle on the left, that's PXPY, to move and I'm going to keep the other particle fixed. So to move that particle we're going to say, we're going to make a velocity and let's say the velocity is initially zero. So PX V velocity, PY velocity, uh, P is for particle by the way, and uh, that's all we need to do except you know when we run it nothing happens because oh we need to uh, update PX equals 
well, let's do it this way, plus equals px velocity, py um, moves according to the py velocity, and this is still not going to do anything because the velocity is zero. Uh, so here's where we get to build the mechanics of a spring in here. And what we're going to do is say that, uh, let's say the spring length is, um, oh, uh, 120. Okay. And so what's, what's the actual distance between these points? Well, let's just compute it. The distance is the distance from px py to px2 py2. Um, so what's the distension on the spring? How much is the spring stretched? Um, need a variable for that. Let's call it s for stretch. And we'll say that that is distance minus 120. So 120 will be the kind of the natural, the, the rest, the length of the spring when it's not being stretched. Uh, and we just take the difference between the actual distance and the uh, normal length of the spring, and that gives us how far the string is spring is distended or stretched, and that's s. And we know from the spring law that the force is equal to minus k times times the stretch. All right, that's that minus k x uh, that we saw before. So let's change it to x and make it match the formula. Why not? Uh, OK, so now we have Hooke's law minus kx, f equals minus kx. So how do we apply that force to the spring? Well, we know that uh, if, we knew the if, if we knew the force in the x and y dimensions, we could say that px velocity is increased by, let's call it px force, and py velocity is increased by py force, right? But what's? But we only know force. We don't know the x force and the y force. So let's try to compute that. Now let's think about this. So the px force is going to be um, the uh, change in x. OK, so that's, this is the distance along the x divided by the total distance and uh, times something. So let's let's put a time in there. And uh, py force, uh, well, actually, it's going to be proportional to force, isn't it? Uh, so let's write this out. So what, what these equations are saying is that, um, you know, here's, here's the force. The force could be at some angle, and it's got an x uh, portion and it's got a y component. So we're trying to decompose this uh, force that has x and y into an x part and a y part. And so you know, the bigger the force, the more x and the more y there is. Um, so that's, that's why it's, we multiply by force. And uh, the bigger the distance between um, the bigger component along the uh, x-axis, then the bigger the x-force is going to be. So this is the distance along x. And similarly, the greater the distance along y, uh, the bigger things are, uh, the bigger the force is going to be in y direction. And um, all of this gets uh, divided by, by d, um, which uh, kind of normalizes things. So if it was purely in the x direction, the distance would be, let's see, px minus px2. Uh, so we'd have px minus px2 divided by px minus px2. 
anything divided by itself is one. So we would say all of the force gets multiplied by one and added to PXF, for example. Uh, okay, so now I think we're done. Let's try to run this and see what happens. Oh, K is not defined. We need K. Uh, let's give a small number for the spring constant to start things off. And boom, there we go. The thing is oscillating. So that's the uh, spring-like motion. If we make the spring constant bigger, we'll make it a lot bigger. Uh, the thing really is it's very springy. It goes fast. If we make the spring constant much smaller, we get a very slow uh, motion here. Now another cool thing we can do is set the initial y velocity to some positive value. Let's speed it up a little bit. And we can run that. And look at this. Uh, the thing is sort of in, in this funky orbit. Uh, bouncing back and forth on the spring. So it's really interesting that, that somehow we got circular motion just by implementing uh, forces and integrating things po uh, properly. All right, now there's no damping happening here. So one thing we would uh, could do is apply some damping. And uh, if we did damping the fully correct way, we would we would compute velocity and then uh, separate it out into x and y components to, to give a damping force. But I think I'm going to use the same trick I did Monday, which is kind of a half-baked uh, damping factor. So we'll just say, first of all, what's the, uh, we'll, we'll say, let's just say that the damping is uh, proportional to x. This will be a little bit different from Monday, I think. Um, so we've, we've got, um, uh, let's call it the damping x force. <laughs> and we'll say that that's proportional to minus pxv times some damping factor. And let's say the damping y force is equal to minus PYV times some damping factor. So I guess we better define damping up here. Bar damping equals 0 0.01. And this is an additional force. Right, so oh, so we could just add it in down here. We'll say we got the spring force plus the damping force added into velocity. So let's try running that and see what happens. Oh, nice. How about that? The thing just kind of comes to rest. We could uh, simplify that motion a little bit by setting the initial y velocity to zero. And now we have this, uh, uh, this is called an underdamped oscillation. So let's turn up the damping and see what happens. Hmm, that's almost critically damped. You see it, it barely bounced at all. And then uh, we could set the damping even higher let's say 0.7 and now we have an underdamped system it's so viscous it's like a spring pulling a ball through molasses or something um, and uh, so that's the idea behind springs we take all of this uh, physics and math and turn it into uh, objects and implement multiple particles and then we can have lots of springs and lots of particles all bouncing and jiggling around in our sketches.